Welcome back everyone, it's me Matt. I really appreciate you stopping by on today's video. We're talking about artillery again, yes, my favourite thing in the world, other than tanks that is of course, but Russian artillery has always been something of pure beauty, whether it be the mass volleys of rockets being sent across the sky, or the thermobaric rounds that can literally absorb your soul and turn it into pure heat. However, Russian artillery is also terrifying in the size and ferocity of the forms that we see today, and today we are going to discuss the weapon system that ticks that in both of those boxes in every sense of the word. The 2A36 Gassin B, or Hyacinth in English, which is ironic that it's named after a rather fragile and beautiful flower, is a gigantic towed artillery gun that is engineered to be the forefront of Russian field artillery. The 2A36 has strikingly large barrel size which hosts a firepower of 152mm projectiles which, considering the size of the gun, is kind of underwhelming. When you think of the M777 and the 155mm projectile, you know it's a large field gun, but the look of the 2A36 makes you think it has the round of the size of a tall man going inside of it. Interestingly though, this gun is just one of many field guns and artillery weapons around this size of calibre and round size that Russia utilises. This is because a lot of the older style guns from World War II have been improved or adapted upon to make more modern field guns we see today in the Russian military. Interestingly also that these guns are being capitalised by many other countries around the world because they work, and they work very well. The reason why this conventional style gun was kept in service for so long is twofold. Firstly, the gun was a formidable field gun that has proven its worth in many conflicts as a long range artillery piece and still to this day is in active service worldwide with many militaries. Secondly, and what you're seeing in most of this footage, is that the gun is quite the deterrent to tanks and oncoming waves of enemy forces that can be struck with direct fire capabilities. In other words, in the older times where tanks were a lot less advanced than they are now, the gun would be a formidable anti-tank platform. Sadly though, in today's standards, the gun is not best suited to take on the more modern and technologically advanced weapons and tank platforms out there. But where did the design of this field gun come from? Well, of course, the Soviets begun the journey for this incredible weapon, beginning in the late 1960s when Soviet engineers began a design and development of a required new 152mm towed field gun. The Perm Automobile Factory SKV started to develop a new 152mm gun in November 1968, which was to have an extended range of fire. Development sped up in the early 1970s together with the self-propelled 2S5 to provide long-range shelling and counter-battery fire. The 2A36 replaced the M46 in this role and provided a massive increase in performance. The 2A36 was also known as the M1976 by NATO. The self-propelled 2S5 version of the gun is also known as the Gassint S. The guns were field tested in 1971 and 1972, and deliveries to the Soviet army began in 1975 with very promising results. The 2A36 uses a split trail carriage with four wheel chassis. A single jack is used to raise the chassis of the ground into the firing position. The carriage also features a split trail arrangement that doubles as the recoil legs when the gun sits in its placement for firing. The gun is very you know, lumpy, and to be honest, as I said before, considering this is only a 152mm projectile firing gun platform, it faults for the weight of this gun, which in total weighs at a whopping 21,500 pounds. Most of that is taken up with the carriage and the trails. The gun when set up is also quite large, with a length of 40 feet when completely set up to fire. The gun itself is a 152mm 49 caliber rifled howitzer with a multi-slotted muzzle brake fitted. 
The brake alone weighs 141 kilograms and absorbs up to 53% of recoil power when firing that massive round. The remaining recoil power is absorbed by a hydraulic recoil brake mounted over the barrel and moves with it when it fires. The ordnance is mounted on a cradle that allows for elevation and limited traverse spanning from minus 2 to plus 57 degrees to serve in both direct and indirect fire rolls as needed. Traverse is limited to minus 25 to plus 25 degrees either side. In the firing position, the trail legs are split and the gun rests on a circular jack under the forward part of the carriage. Several types of trail spades are actually available to suit the season for this gun. The summer spades, which are basically the back end of the trails that dig into the soil, are larger to suit softer ground. In the winter they are spiked and a little bit tighter to actually engage into the ice. This assists in bedding in of the trails for more accurate and safer sustained fire missions, along with a lot more safer sustained fire missions when in the direct fire roll, because when this gun fires, trust me, it pushes a lot of force backwards onto those trails. To assist in loading, there is a swiveling loading tray and hydraulic rammer that utilizes a semi-automatic breech block action when the loading-reloading hydraulic power system is used. This also helps with elevation. The breech system is a self-releasing hydropneumatic accumulator cartridge eject system, which basically means the gun ejects that huge casing out the back of the gun when the breech pulls back into battery or its natural seating position. This is one of the coolest features of the gun in my eyes, and as an artillery gunner myself, there is nothing more satisfying than watching an empty cartridge of that size being ejected from the breach of such an amazing gun with smoke pluming out of it. It's what brings hairs on the back of my neck knowing that just milliseconds before it was mated to 152mm worth of projectile. A simple gun shield does provide crew of 8 with some protection over the frontal arc, but it's also very useful for any backblast coming from the incredible sized slots of the muzzle brake at the front of the barrel. Debris being placed back from 152mm of round shot at direct fire is deadly, which is why in a lot of the footage that you are seeing, the gun and the crews are pulling the lanyard at an extended rope trigger to the gun from distance. This is also partly because of the huge amount of recoil that can be caused by the gun firing at a straight angle and moving the gun to crush or injure its crew from the trails. However, just like most field guns, once the trails of the gun are embedded and seeded into the soil, the gun will hold firm where it is at. The direct fire and indirect sights are mounted on the left side of the carriage, as are the elevation and traverse mechanisms allowing the operator to work from only one side of the gun instead of two. This reduces the need for another operator on the right hand side of the carriage, but sadly increases the workload of the operator using the sights and traverse elevation mechanisms. Error is also arguably increased with the use of only one person aiming and aligning the gun line from the commander's orders. The 2A36 fires its own range of 152mm ammunition that is not interchangeable with the older 152 ammunition such as that used by the D20. A wide range of ammunition is available though, which includes high explosive fragmentation, rocket assisted, armor piercing, illumination, and smoke. Interestingly, there is also the potential for this weapon system, from what I've researched, to fire nuclear weapons platforms. The maximum range is 27 kilometers for standard shells and 40 kilometers for rocket assisted shells. Russian sources indicate a maximum range of only 33 kilometers with rocket assisted shells, however. The direct range for engagement in indirect or direct fire engagements with tank is 2 kilometers. The maximum rate of fire is around 5 to 6 rounds per minute, which is pretty impressive considering the round size that this thing is actually firing. The shells exit the muzzle at 3,100 feet per second with listed ranges for conventional ammunition quite similar to that of its western counterparts. The artillery piece relies on the operating crew of 8 which is made up of a group leader, ammunition handlers, beefy ones at that, and the gun layers. You may think 8 is a lot of people but this is actually quite standard across most gun platforms of this size and even smaller ones that are out there today globally, including my beautiful C3 howitzer of Canada, which is only a 105mm gun. 
However, the gun is quite self-sustaining with its hydraulically assisted systems. The rammer is useful to see the projector on cartridge, but for the most part it's still getting the round to the gun that's the hard part. And in terms of setting the gun in place though, it can be raised with the hydraulic system also. Of course, the gun is not just reliant on the hydraulic system, it can be set up with old fashioned gun drill and elbow grease. This is how gunnery should be of course. The guns are usually deployed in batteries of 6 to 8 guns, and some promotional materials that I found claims that a battery can place more than 1 ton of projectiles on a target in 1 minute. In Russian service, the gun is usually towed by the Kraz 269-ton 6x6 truck or by an artillery tractor such as the AT-T or the ATS-59 or the ATS-S or the MTT. The, the list goes on. It can be towed by a lot of different trucks. When towed, the carriage is supported by the four wheel, two wheels on each side, walking beam suspension, permitting the gun to be towed over rough terrain. But you got to be careful with this thing. It's beefy, it's big, and you do not want to be pushing it hard across really rough terrain. Remember that an artillery piece is just like an instrument that is used for measuring. It has a lot of calibrated and designed components that are there to be kept in a certain way. The projectile, when it is loaded inside with the carriage and the breech of the chain from the loading mechanism, is also very temperamental. Similar to that of the lining up of the sights in the direct fire, all these different things need to be considered when towing this gun. It is fragile, even though it is beefy. Its size and weight do make it difficult to transport. Nonetheless, though, it may be towed up to 80 km an hour on road and 30 km an hour off road. Currently, operational 2A36s have been modernised and are equipped with new systems such as a battery unit to allow it to operate some of the more technical and, I guess, advanced systems that allow it to be more precise, such as the NAP, which is a satellite positioning unit which consists of a satellite receiver and an antenna unit. It also has a self-orientating gyroscopic angle measuring system, a computer to link all these systems up, and a mechanical speed gauge. Overall, the system is quite comprehensive to allow the gun to work alongside the Command and Control Center for fire missions when given orders to the gun group. It is quite accurate to the point of putting rounds on target within at least 50 to 60 meters of where the round was first fallen or shot when given the adjust for fire, which, considering the size of the gun, is pretty good. It's not the most accurate weapon system in the world, but you have to remember that it is still using quite primitive technology to put projectiles on target. Not to the same standard or caliber of, say, the Paladin with the, you know, GPS assisted projectiles out there today, but that's not saying that the 2A36 is not going to have more upgrades in the future. The gun is here to stay, and to say that it's, you know, not going to be used in the future would be a crazy statement. So that's it for today everyone, I hope you really enjoyed learning something about this impressive Russian artillery piece. I have to admit, researching it and learning about it was a lot of fun. If you did enjoy today's video, please leave me a like if you want to be notified of any upcoming content from my channel in the future. All you have to do is click that little bell button by the subscribe button on your screen right now and you'll be notified of when I produce more content and I'd really appreciate it if you could because the YouTube algorithm really doesn't like me making military content. I'd like to also really thank everyone who has been, you know, supporting me on Patreon, whether it be by donation or supporting me on Super Chats with live streams or whatever else, and also sending direct PayPal, uh, you know, payments to my channel and myself. It is really personally uh, very, very appreciated, so I can't thank you enough. Really does mean a lot to me, and also those who have become members of my channel, thank you for your subscription to my channel. It really does mean a lot. Um, if you do want to be uh, getting involved with any more parts of my channel, you can also check the description box for my Facebook and my Discord channel, etc. So you can get uh, involved with the Matsmus uh, Legion and everyone else a part of my community. Thank you again, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day. See you next time. Bye-bye.